Hello, and um, welcome back to uh, Frosty's OP, and if this is your first time here, hello. Uh, so today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a book overview, and the books I'm going to be covering is a series uh, called the Agent Cormac series, written by a British author called uh, Neil Asher. Uh, I've got my notes here, so I'm pretty prepared. I did a quite a lot of background work on this. When I first started, I thought, yeah, I'll just talk about these books, it'd be great. And uh, you suddenly realise that it's uh, quite a big job, and there's actually pages and pages in front of this of notes, which I've managed to compile down to with something a little bit more meaningful. Now, one of the important things is uh, this is a book overview. It's not a book review. Um, I'm not here to, to give my opinions about the author's competence of writing. I don't think I'm in any way qualified to do that. You know, Neil put like seven, eight years of his life into these books. And the reason I'm talking about them is I thoroughly enjoyed reading them and want to share that experience. And I'm not here to sort of give a literary review of, of these books. Now, um, one of the things I have to say right now, no spoilers. Okay, I've been very, very careful to not give away any of the plots or anything that's happening in these books. What I'm doing instead is giving you an outline of the kind of things you will find in, this, in the Agent Cormac series. Uh, as, cause, as you well know, when you look at the back of a book, uh, you don't really get an idea of, of what the book is really about and whether it's going to be your kind of thing. And as the saying goes, you can't judge a book by its cover. Now, the uh, series consists of five books. So the first one is Gridlinked, second one is Line Quality, followed by Brass Man, Policy Agent, and Line War. Now, you'll notice these two, the covers don't match the rest of the series. Uh, the reason why is actually, um, I've lent the first two to a family member of mine who's reading them, and so I had to go out and get these to make sure I had the complete set and do my finish my research properly. Uh, the rest of great because I got them from Food and Planet and they are all actually signed by Neil Asher, which is cool, super cool. And there's one last book, which I will mention at the end, which is actually a prequel uh, called Shadow of the Scorpion. And I'll go a little bit into that just at the end. But these five books are all one long continuing uh, unfolding story. Uh, each book in itself, is a concise story, but there is an ongoing theme that goes through all five books. Now, the books are set in 2434, so it's a few hundred years into the future, and the, uh, the books span about a 10 year period. Uh, and these are all the events that unfold in those 10 years. Now, um, being sci-fi, these are all set in a universe and this universe is called The Polity. And those of you that have read Ian Banks and are familiar with the culture uh, will see a sort of a common theme here, that um, they, the main uh, people who make up, or sort of the main species that make up this, this um, universe are humans and AI. Uh, there are other sentient species, uh, but they are few and far between. It's not the Star Trek universe, you know, where you've got sort of Andorians and Vulcans and everything else. No. In this, uh, there's only really two sentient species uh, that uh, are around at this time. Uh, the first are called the Praedor, and they were a sort of a crustacean killer crab species. And they were, the humans were involved in the AI and the polity were involved in war with them prior to these books. And that's covered a little bit in the prequel, and then there's actually a pre pre prequel before that, that actually talks about that, that whole battle. So that's pretty much the only sentient civilization that uh, the, the polity have been in contact with. Um, beyond that, uh, there is also another sentient species called dragon. Now stop, don't, 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 don't click, don't go away. That it's not fantasy, that there's, there isn't a dragon. There's no mythical creature breathing fire. It is an alien who decided to call himself dragon. Now, this particular creature is prevalent throughout all of these books and is a key character and uh, very ambiguous, very strange, very alien. And that's one of the things that I actually really liked about uh, the Adrian Cormac series was that this alien doesn't make sense to us and his behaviour and his reasoning isn't in any way fathomable. 
which is how it should be to me. You know, it's they're alien. That's their general idea. And um, this character, you know, will be throughout all the books and, and, and is, is fascinating. Now, moving on, uh, the policy universe um, started with, like I say, Gridlinked, which this was written in 2001. Uh, but it didn't date at all, okay, and it's, it's not dated in the sense that the Polity universe is still being used today by Neil Asher and he's still writing in this universe. And there are other series, so Agent Cormac is the first one, then we had Spatterjay, Transformation, and now there's Rise of the Jane, and each of these series has you know, two or three books within it. But today we're just covering Agent Cormac. So who is Agent Cormac? Now, Agent Cormac is essentially a ECS agent. Um, now ECS stands for Earth Central Security. Um, AIs rule and control all of the polity and they uh, kind of took over and I'll cover that in a little while. And so Agent Cormac is a human who works with the AIs in order to police uh, the polity. Now the polity doesn't comprise all of the universe. There are other planets that don't belong to polity that have humans on them. And we will come across alien species as well. So that just comes up to the next thing. Uh, so I've mentioned humans and AIs. Uh, the universe is um, accessible uh, by two main technologies. One is something we call a runcible. And a runcible is, is a teleport. And these are installed on planets. They're managed by AIs and allow instantaneous movement between planets. So all polity planets are linked through these runcibles. And the technology came about after being discovered by a human who managed to interface with the computer for all of 23 minutes before frying his mind. And in those 23 minutes, he developed the runcible and anti-gravity. So we have anti-gravity in here. It's not explained exactly how, but we have it. <laughs> So, um, I've covered my sentient aliens, um, and so coming back to the humans, uh, we have um, augmented humans. So, most humans are what they call gridlinked, and this means that they are interfaced into a computer system, so their version of the, of the internet. They have access to information, and it's directly implanted through these augmentations, and we call them augment, and they live behind their ears. Uh, we also have adapted humans, you know, that um, they have good understanding of genetics. And so you have uh, humans that will just modify themselves cosmetically. So you have like cat adapts and off adapts, cat adapts being feline humans and the off adapts being you know, sort of snake humans. And these are purely cosmetic, you know, it's just a, a look that humans are, are happy to have. Then moving on from that, um, we then have further on uh, we have outlinkers, for example, who are humans that have modified themselves specifically to live in zero G. And uh, they can't actually live in, in, in an environment with one G because they would just crush them. But they are perfectly suited for living in space stations and working in space stations. So that's outlinkers. And we'll come across as well another uh, modified human called a hymen. And that's where a human is completely merged with an AI and also uses a, what they call a carapace, which is um, a sort of a suit that they can wear that then augments all of their, uh, all of their senses and abilities. And uh, so they come up later on in the, book as, in the books as well. So um, coming back to the AI, uh, the AI are central in these books and the AIs are also characters. Uh, they have you know, their own uh, traits, so to speak. Now AIs come in different forms. We have AIs that are planetary AIs and those actually manage everything that's happening on the planet uh, and also normally manage the runcibles uh, because only AIs can do the mapping necessary to uh, transport people through the, uh, through the runcibles. Uh, we have ships, AI ships, very similar to the culture in that respect. And these can be warships, research ships, transport ships, dreadnoughts, etc. Um, we then have uh, androids, and androids uh, can be either uh, proxies that are used by the AIs. Uh, so in other words, let's say a runcible AI needs to run an errand, it will take an android and 
put a part of itself in there and use that Android to communicate with people or to perform a particular task. But also you have AIs um, who actually live in an Android body. And these Android bodies are called Golem. And the Golems are essentially human emulations. The idea is, is they, are, they wish to look as human as possible. And for all intents and purposes are human when you, when you see them and in their behavior and, and uh, so forth. So that's kind of the AI. Oh, there's a, one other type of AI as well, which doesn't come into a little bit later and also in the prequel, and those are war drones. <clears throat> that uh, these were developed for the Praetor War, and these drones are essentially war machines, but are thinking war machines that think for themselves. And uh, we get some interesting characters with those as well, which is pretty, really cool. So that kind of covers, you know, the what we find in the polity, you know, in terms of AIs and in terms of humans. And then we come on, come on to the actual stories themselves. Now, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Now, Agent Cormac is, is an investigator. And I can tell you, at least it's not giving anything away, that the story starts with a runcible exploding on a waypoint planet. Now, these things normally never go wrong. And it is potentially sabotage or something has, has gone wrong. And so he's uh, led to investigate that. Alongside that, uh, there are a, a group called separatists. And uh, even though the polity is supposedly a perfect work, you know, a perfect universe for humans, you know, there's always going to be some people that are not happy. And separatists is essentially the name for the, the terrorists uh, who are against the polity. And Agent Cormac is, has to try and root them out and. Uh, and uses whatever means necessary to do that. Now, the reason why this book is called Gridlinked is because Agent Cormac has spent too much time being gridlinked and his, uh, was stripping away his humanity. And so therefore, for his own um, best health, it was necessary for him to stop being gridlinked. And he therefore has to rely purely on his humanity and his, you know, his base skills that are in his own mind in order to call upon in order to, to resolve situations. And that, that is good in the sense that it, it makes us much more able to um, connect with Agent Cormac and understand what he's doing and why he's doing it. Um, within the books, we have different nemesis. So, you know, we have uh, Agent Cormac will be dealing with a nemesis called Pelter, uh, who is a separatist who is out for revenge. Uh, for, due to uh, some actions on, on, on Agent Cormac's part. And then we move on to another nemesis called Skellor. Now Skellor kind of ups the ante a little bit as he gets involved with something called uh, Jane technology. Now the Jane feature throughout these books and the Jane are a dead civilization. But um, what is uh, of concern to the polity about the Jane is that they were uh, heavily involved in biotech and what they created with these things called Jane nodes and these Jane nodes uh, are based upon something called nanomycelia now nanomycelia means that they are they work like mycelium mycelium are the uh, the strands of the filaments that you get on fungus you know, which spread out you know like on moss spread out and anything they touch they acquire feed off of it and grow from it and this is a, basically a biotech version of that, so it's a machine version. It will consume anything, uh, whether it's genetic, human, uh, uh, or technological, and acquire it in order to grow and, and take over. And so the, these Jane nodes create great concern. And uh, Skelor uh, has uh, some interaction with that, and that creates you know, a huge story from there, which then spreads over the next two books. So Pelter's in the first book, then we have Skelor in the next two. And then once we get onto Policy Agent and Line War, uh, things escalate even further and uh, we start getting AI conflicts. Now I've kind of uh, covered already you know, a lot of the books. I'm not going to go into individual details about each book because I think that would spoil it. But I can tell you that the storytelling, uh, generally uh, every book has about two to three ongoing threads. So there'll be some Agent Cormac and then, you know, doing one particular thing and then you know, on another thread, there may be Skelor and what he's up to, etc., etc. So, but generally, the books flow very well, 
and uh, makes them very, very easy to read. And uh, the action is, is, is constant. You know, you're always wanting to turn over the next page. Now, Agent Cormac isn't alone. Uh, he has a, a number of people that uh, are in his kind of uh, circle. And we have Thorn, Gant, Sento, and Aiden, who are Sparkind. And Sparkind are, uh, to use a Warhammer term, they're kind of space marines or you know, special forces. Uh, what makes them interesting is that Thorn and Gant are human, uh, Aiden and Sento are Golem, you know, and they work together and use each of their skill sets to you know, create a, a complete unit. Um, these characters, uh, along with Stanton and Jarvelis, uh, Stanton is a mercenary, uh, I mean, an interesting character. Uh, Jarvelis is, uh, she's a pilot and a smuggler. And uh, then we have Mika, who comes along, who's a scientist and uh, a medic. And kind of these, these people form up the main group, along with Scar, who, uh, I won't say anything more about Scar, except that he is an enigmatic creature. And Nessus can't necessarily be trusted. And between all of these characters, you know, they, they appear at various stages throughout the book. Now, some live, some die, I'm not going to say which, uh, but they, they all play a part in, in these books. And what is nice is that uh, you, you really get to know the characters and uh, when they pop up again in the books, you, you understand why they're there and uh, you, you take as much interest in what they're up to as well as uh, Adrian Cormac. It's not just about this one character. And one character that definitely needs mentioning is Mr. Crane. Uh, Mr. Crane is a golem and uh, his um, involvement in these books uh, is substantial, uh, but also he is a fascinating character as he evolves a great deal uh, during these books. And you never quite know where you stand with Mr. Crane. So I, I really liked it. I think probably out of all these books, I think he's probably my favorite character. So that's kind of covered everything. Uh, in terms of this kind of storytelling that I want to talk about, but um, it is very much a roller coaster ride. Now, obviously, being sci fi, um, you know, and there is conflict, you know, because we have obviously the, the Jane situation, we have these nemesis like just Skelor and the separatists. Uh, now, one thing I should say with Neil Asher, it's violent, okay? You have you, <laughs> there will be lots of violence, and there's violence on, on all levels that the violence. Uh, uh, on an individual basis is very graphic and very gory and you know as we move along in the books and the conflicts kind of go up in scale you know there's there's a lot of death and uh, you know, death on a very very big scale and uh, the weapons in in this you know, are very much uh, for the, the kind of individual weapons the smaller weapons are all projectile based Hence why you, know, you get some very gory outcomes described because these weapons will shoot aluminium dust at supersonic speeds, which you can imagine makes a bit of a mess. And then when you go into the bigger weapons, you, know, you go right up to energy weapons, lasers, masers, right up to something called a CTD, which is a contra, contra terrene device, uh, which is an anti-matter weapon. Uh, so you can imagine that with this, this kind of weaponry in these books, um, yeah, a lot of things blow up and a lot of things die. A lot of people die and a lot of creatures die. Now, not all of it is set in space. Uh, some of it is set on planets. And we have two main planets that, that are involved in these books. One is called Masada and the other one is called Kull. Uh, these planets are also fascinating themselves. And Neil Ash has done a great job of creating an ecosystem on each of these planets. And these ecosystems are, are fascinating in, in, in the way they operate and you know, very, very imaginative. And I can tell you that you do not want to be living on the planet of Masada. Um, the creatures there are yeah, pretty nasty. You know, they will, they will not do very nice things to you. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But yeah, you know, squirms and hooders and things, you see one of them, you're probably not going to have a very good day. Uh, so, and what's, uh, what's very nice as well is that um, when we're, we've got activity on the planets and we've got storytelling on the planets, we also have characters that are from those planets. And so we learn of the society from, from their point of view. And, um, and so what it means is that you, you really start to feel for what it's like to, to live on that planet and to not necessarily be part of the polity and you know, how alien you know, life 
takes place, or sorry, uh, life on planets outside of this uh, uh, polity takes place. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is, uh, which is um, a really, really enjoyable, is that in many of the books, each paragraph, so each chapter, starts with a, a preface, which is taken as, as part of a media guide from, um, from things like the, something called the Quince Guide. And what it does is it gives you a bit of an overview as to how the polity operates and some of its history. Now, I grabbed one bit here, which is I thought was really good because it describes the AIs really well and, and their, the part they play. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to read you through this little preface. Okay, um, the quiet war. This is often how the AI takeover is described, and even using war seems overly dramatic. It was more of a slow usurpation of human political and military power, while humans were busy using that power against each other. It wasn't even very stealthy. Analogies have been drawn with someone moving a gun out of the reach of a lunatic while that person is ranting and bellowing at someone else. And so it was. AIs, long used in the many corporate, national and religious conflicts, took over all communication networks and the computer control of weapon systems. Most importantly, they already controlled the enclosed human environments scattered throughout the solar systems. Also establishing themselves as corporate entities, they soon accrued vast wealth with which to employ human mercenary armies. National leaders in the solar system, ordering this launch or that attack, found their orders either just did not arrive or caused no response. Those same people, ordering the destruction of the AIs, found themselves weaponless in environments utterly out of their control and up against superior forces and on the whole public opinion. It had not taken the general population, for whom it was a long established tradition to look upon the human leaders with contempt, very long to realise that the AIs were better at running everything. And so it is very difficult to motivate people to revolution when they're extremely comfortable and well off. From the Quince Guide, compiled by humans. So you guys, that's a little overview of, uh, of the AIs. And like I said, you get these little prefaces at the beginning of chapters. And uh, they give you a really good sort of in, uh, view of, uh, of the polity. And then, so other characters that need to be mentioned very quickly are people like, oh, sorry, not people, uh, species or, or uh, entities like Jack Ketch and Jerusalem, who are actually AIs. Uh, one is a warship, the other one is a research ship. And, you know, they play a, a part, uh, a major part in these books. And... Uh, they become you know, really intriguing characters as well in terms of their motivations and behaviour. So I think that's about it. Um, the one thing I will say as well is that um, you will be picking up the dictionary when you uh, read Neil Asher books, as he does like to use some, uh, some fairly obtuse words and you know, not necessarily obvious words. One of the things you will find is that there's a lot of actinic explosions uh, that take place in, uh, <laughs> in the Agent Cormac series. Uh, dragon is uh, often described as Delphic, and uh, you'll find other words like obdurate, and people are often quite uh, willing to opine. And uh, you will come across quite a few words like that when you go, oh, maybe I need to look that up. So there you go, so that's my overview of the Neil Asher Agent Cormac series. I hope you enjoyed that, I hope it was useful. And um, you know, please leave your comments. If you've read these books, then you know, please, mention, so please mention it in the comments. Please don't, don't, no spoilers. You know, I've gone to great lengths to not put any spoilers in this. So please don't do that in the comments. You know, I want people to really enjoy these books as much as I did and hopefully you did as well. And um, obviously, yeah, if you like this, please subscribe and uh, have a look at the description in my um, YouTube uh, channel so you get the idea of the kind of things that I cover. And uh, don't forget to click the bell if you subscribe so you get notified when I release new stuff because I don't always necessarily release on the same day. And um, yeah, don't forget to like if you enjoyed it. Right? So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully see you again soon.